This is the Grind It Podcast. We know just like grinding a handrail or across the coping can be challenging at times, so can life be. We share God's Word and personal stories to encourage you to keep grinding and to not give up. It's time to grind. So here's the old school skateboarder himself, Randall Tucker. Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. Today we're going to finish up Matthew chapter 17. Peter, James, and John, they had just witnessed this incredible event called the Transfiguration where Jesus was literally transformed right before their very eyes. Yeah, like the Transformers, the the cartoon or the movie. Uh, This word in the Greek is metamorpho, and and it means to be transformed. Jesus underwent a metamorphosis, like a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. And Matthew tells us that Jesus' face shined like the sun, and his clothes were a brilliant white, a bright white. And Moses and Elijah appear on the scene, and they have this conversation with Jesus. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And then to top it all off... God the Father appears in the form of a cloud and he talks to the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. I mean, what an epic moment for these three men. And yet, as they head down the mountain with Jesus, the only thing that they can ask is, or think to ask is, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Um, And so the three, it, it just makes no sense to me, but anyway... The three disciples were told not to speak of the things that they have seen or heard until after Jesus dies on the cross. And then they could tell the others what they had seen. Um, And that would be very hard uh, to do, uh, especially for Peter, I'm sure. But just putting myself in their their shoes, I would want to tell everybody what I've just seen because it would be just the coolest thing that I've ever witnessed. And and I would just love to tell them (laughs) what they missed out on and 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 how moses popped up on the scene and how elijah popped up on the scene and jesus is having a conversation with them and it just would just be so awesome and so they're coming down the mountain you got jesus peter james and john they're coming back down to the other disciples but there's a crowd waiting on them and immediately a man comes up to jesus with a need And Matthew says that a man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly, and he often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Now, as a parent, think of the pain and the suffering that this kid is going through. He's having seizures, and what's weird about these seizures is is the times that he has the seizures. That it seems like just from reading into this, uh, that his he has seizures anytime he's around a fire or when he's around water, and when he has a seizure around fire, he falls into the flames. Now I don't know about you, but if you've ever been burned, it hurts. And if you've burned, if you've been burned really bad, I mean, it melts skin. And it, and so I can just picture this kid who has been burned severely burned and you probably needed skin grafts which they didn't have back then to my knowledge and so he would have terrible scars did he even have any hair because if you've ever lit a fire or been too close to a fire when you light your grill or whatever and it burns some of the hair on your hand or your arm or ever had your hair catch on fire and how quickly it just it, just, it goes up in flames if this kid's falling in the fire, he may not even had hair. I mean, this this kid probably looked pretty pretty bad, and and then he would have seizures when he's around water. So if you're having seizures and you're falling in water, you can drown. So it, it, it's just these seizures just happen at the weirdest times, and it was all because this demon that was in him. It was, I guess the demon was just trying to to just torture the kid and kill the the poor kid. Um, and so the dad goes to the disciples hoping that, you know, they're going to be able to cast this demon out because they had the power to do so. They had the authority to do so. They've already cast demons out. They've, they've already been working miracles. And so you could think about the, this father because no, no parent wants to see their child, uh, hurting, and they don't want to see their child suffering. So you can just imagine the hope this guy has as he brings the, his kid, this son, 
who's going through all this terrible suffering to the disciples, and they try to cast the demon out, but they can't get it to come out. And the disappointment that would be on this man's face, and Jesus is nowhere around. He's gone. But now all of a sudden he sees Jesus coming down the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And so he's going to run up to Jesus and, and literally kneel down before Jesus and, and, and ask Jesus to intervene. And when you read this in Matthew, you can almost feel the father's pain in his voice as he tells Jesus about his son, asking him to, to, to heal his son. You know, he's already disappointed because the, the disciples couldn't do it. And so now here's Jesus who has popped up on the scene. So, you know, there's desperation in his voice because, hey, no parent, if you've ever had a child that, that has had been in an accident or uh, like I, I, my son, my oldest son, uh, had uh, grandma seizures. From the, eight, from the time he was five years old to the time he was 12 years old, he, he had epilepsy. And and he had these grandma seizures. It was r- horrific to see, and it looked painful. And, and when they the first time he had some, you know, it freaked us out. We didn't know what was going on. We thought he was dying. We thought he was in just tremendous pain. And we rushed him to the, you know, to the emergency room, and, and they told us what was going on. And then he finally outgrew it by the time he was 12 years old. And and so he hasn't had a seizure since. Thank the Lord for that. And I pray that he doesn't. But grandma's seizures, they, 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 they're brutal to, to see. Uh, one time I was at a Tennessee football game. You know, you got a, a crowd of 100,000 people. Well, this guy, uh, probably in his early 20s, uh, was behind us. And all of a sudden we hear this, and we turn around. And what happened was, we were standing up cheering, and he had. A, I mean, because you don't never know; they can come on at any time. You don't. You have no warning. Just boom! There's a seizure, and you're, and you're down. And so we were standing up cheering, and this guy uh, goes into a grandma seizure, collapses, hits his head on the bleachers, and everybody starts freaking out. Well, we knew exactly what was going on because my son, you know, we had dealt with this with my son, and so you know, we told the people, give him plenty of space. We put him on his side, and. And uh, we t- explained to the people what was going on that he'd be okay, and we sent somebody off to to get help, and and, you know, and then the paramedics came and and, and took the guy. Um, but these grandma seizures, they they look dangerous and they 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 look painful. But this kid would have grandma seizures because of this demon, but he didn't just have the seizures; he was falling into fire and getting burned. Or he's falling into water and and drowning, and and so I don't know if the father just happened to be there and would rescue, his, you know, or if somebody was there to rescue him from this water so he wouldn't drown. I don't know, but this kid was being absolutely tortured, and this dad was being tortured because he couldn't do anything for his son, and now he's he's found hope in the disciples. They can't get the job done. And so here comes Jesus, and so he's going to run to Jesus and kneel down before Jesus, begging Jesus to heal his son. And so Jesus cast his demon out, and Matthew says from that moment on that the boy was well. Now, thinking about it, the disciples, they, as I said a while ago, they've been given power to cast out demons, and, and they've healed people in the past, but for whatever reason, this time they could not get the job done. They could not cast out that demon so they asked jesus they said what's the deal now i'm paraphrasing here this is my version of the story what's the deal jesus why couldn't we cast that demon out and jesus says and this is the new living translation jesus says you don't have enough faith i tell you the truth if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed you could say to this mountain move it from here to there and it would move but nothing would be impossible now later manuscripts add this by saying but this kind does not talking about the casting out of demons this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting now the king james version uh instead of saying you don't have enough faith and i've I've got an issue with that about that that the way that version reads but the, the and i'll explain that here in just a second but the king james version says because of your unbelief you couldn't cast out the demon there, there's a huge difference there and I, I like this better i like the way the king james uh, uh, translates what Jesus says. 
because of your unbelief, you couldn't cast this demon out. Um, because the dis- if you, I mean, just think about this for a second. Let's talk about this. The disciples absolutely had faith. I mean, they have seen Jesus work miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, they've seen a dead girl come from. Uh, uh, they've seen a girl rise from the dead. Uh, they themselves have worked miracles. They themselves have cast out demons. So it's not that the disciples don't have faith, but what they do have a problem with is unbelief, like the King James Version translates it. They, they have faith, but a lot of times they have unbelief. They waver in their faith. They doubt it, they, they are constantly doubting Jesus. For example, they had just seen Jesus feed 5,000 men, and that doesn't include women and children, so there's probably ten to 15,000 people there with two fish and five loaves of bread. But just a few days later, when he's in the region of Tyre and Sidon, and there's over 4,000 people that had been with him for three days, and he wants to feed them, and it was Jesus' idea to feed them, and all they could do is come up with a few fish and some bread, and they say, How, this ain't going to be enough. He just multiplied two fish and five loaves of bread. And you had 12 basketfuls remaining. And now you're doubting again? And it, it was just, you know, just a, a short time later. And, and then when another example is when Jesus comes walking on the water. And the disciples are out there in the Sea of Galilee. And this storm is going on. And they're out there rowing for their lives. And they think that Jesus is a ghost. And, and so Jesus starts to talk to him. He says, hey, it's me. And, and here comes the doubt when Peter says, hey, if it's really you, then let me walk out to you. And Jesus says, come on. Well, James 1 chapter, uh, James chapter 1 verses 5 through 8 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask... You must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. That's what James said. That's not what I'm saying. That's what James says. When you ask, when you ask God for something, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. It's not that the disciples didn't have faith. They had faith. They, they, they had faith in Jesus. They knew that he was, was the Messiah. They believed in him. They had cast out demons and they had worked miracles for themselves. They have seen Jesus do this over and over and over again. So they, it's not that they didn't have faith, but what they had a problem with was doubt. They were constantly doubting Jesus. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves and honest before God, because God already knows, we struggle with the same thing. We have an issue with doubt. They were there firsthand. They were seeing Jesus with their very own eyes do all of these things. And yet they struggled with doubt over and over and over again. And here we are 2,000 years later. Jesus is not standing before us. Jesus is not walking on this earth. We're not getting a, a cloud showing up with a voice coming from it saying, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. We're, we're not, you know, who brings me great joy. We're not, we're not getting all that. What we have is a book that we can read and, and hear these stories of how Jesus impacted these people's lives. All we have is stories to go on of how Jesus died on a cross for our sins and and he was laid in a tomb for three days and on the third day he rose from the grave. Those guys seen it with their own eyes. We we don't get that opportunity. We we just can read a book. And I mean to be honest with you, I, I hate to read. I don't like to read. The Bible's about the only book that I do read. But I love reading and studying the Bible. It's exciting to me. But you talking about having to have faith and not doubting 
They were seeing it with their own eyes on a daily basis for three to three and a half years, yet they struggle with doubt. All we have is a book to read, and we're 2,000 years removed. We've never seen Jesus. We've never seen the Holy Spirit. We've never seen God the Father. We've never heard his voice, but yet we have to believe. We have to put our faith and our trust in God just as they did and not doubt. Because the the message that James tells us in James 1, it hasn't changed. If We can have all the faith we want. But if we doubt, then don't expect anything to get don't expect to get anything from God. That's what James says, and that still reigns true even today. Jesus tells him again that he's going to be betrayed, that he's going to die, and that he's going to be raised to life on the third day. And the last time that he told them this is when Peter stuck his foot in his mouth and, and said, I ain't going to let this happen. You're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Satan meaning opposition. Now this time when Jesus tells them he's going to be betrayed and die and be raised back to life on the third day, they don't say a word. Matthew just says that they were filled with grief. And this word literally means that they were filled with great sorrow. And if you think about it, hey, no, nobody wants to talk about death. I mean, it's morbid and it's sad. It just, it just automatically just makes people sad to know that our loved ones, are, you know, they're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be here forever. And and when when a loved one starts talking about dying, it's like I don't want to hear this. Let's let's talk about something else because we see death as a finality. It's it's, it's the end. Uh, the disciples are doing that. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to die. They didn't want to hear that because of all this great stuff that Jesus is doing, they want to talk about that. They want to be involved in that. They don't want to hear, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be leaving you. Um, and it's the same thing with us. Nobody, nobody wants to hear their loved ones talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about a will, even though a will is a great thing to have. We don't want to think about that. We want to think about life, and we want to think about living for now because we're with our loved ones and, and but you know we, we 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 don't understand that death is it, it it's not a fin- finality it's not the end because if we're in christ and our loved ones were in christ we're going to see him again and not only are we going to see him again but we're going to spend eternity with them and there will be no more death there'll be no more separation we'll be together talking and and having conversations and 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 loving one another and loving god and and spending time with the father and the son and the holy spirit together for eternity never to be separated again we'll spend eternity with our loved ones and it's going to be awesome and jesus is going to try to explain to his disciples uh the reason why you know he's got to die and the reason why he's going to ascend back to the Father, and he tells us, in, uh, he was telling his disciples, and I believe it's in John 14, the reason why he's got to die, and the reason why he's got to go back to the Father, because he's going to, he says, I'm going to send down my Holy Spirit, and if I don't go to my Father, I can't do this, I, I can't get this done. And so it's necessary that I go back to the Father so that my Spirit, the Holy Spirit, could come into the world and you know, can uh, he can live inside the believers' uh, lives and direct them. He he is our leader, um, and not only that, but he is our seal. He is our guarantee to get into heaven. So yes, death hurts, right? It's sad, but it's not the end. In fact, it's a it, if you think about it, it's the start of a new beginning that's going to last for eternity. But in a way, I can understand their sorrow. Because they have formed this great bond with Jesus, and you know they're thinking, "Hey, he he's 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 going to be our Messiah. He's gonna he's gonna deliver us from this Roman oppression." But then when they hear Jesus is going to die, well, what they're also hearing is he's not going to deliver us from this Roman oppression. We're still going to be uh, under this torture from from these romans and we want to be delivered from them they don't want to hear it so that too would bring them great sorrow and so they don't want to talk about they don't want to hear 
from Jesus that he's going to die and he's going to be buried and he's going to be resurrected. Even though they know that's what the Messiah is supposed to do, they don't understand it. They don't get it. Not until the Holy Spirit falls on them in Acts chapter 2. Now, I love this story that Matthew gives us at the end of chapter 17. He says, On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. And he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, in other words, Peter goes in the house because he wants to ask Jesus. He's, he's going to say, Hey, these guys are here to collect money for the temple tax. You got any money? Because we got to pay these guys. But before Peter could even ask Jesus for some money or tell him what, tell him what's going on, Matthew says, Jesus asked him, What do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? And Peter says, They tax the people they have conquered. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so you know we want to do the right thing. So go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take that coin and pay the tax for both of us. Now, why did Jesus do this? You know he's got to have money laying around the house. I mean, uh, Judas... One of the twelve was the treasure for the group. So they had money. Why Why would Jesus tell Peter to go catch a fish, open his mouth, the first fish that he catches, and pull the coin out from his mouth and go pay the taxes for the both of them? Why, why would he choose to do it that way? Well, think about it. What did Peter do for a living? He fished, right? Before meeting Jesus, he was a commercial fisherman. Now, I don't know who all was in the house where Jesus was at, but I can almost guarantee you that there was enough money available in that house to pay for that temple tax. But yet Jesus is going to use this as an opportunity, yet again, to show Peter that he is the Messiah, that he is the miracle worker, and that he is the provider. And that Peter can put his trust in Jesus. That he don't have to doubt. Quit doubting me, Peter. And trust me. That's what Jesus is saying here. Peter, go and catch a fish and open the fish's mouth and pull out that coin. And go pay the temple tax with it. Jesus could have provided the coins. He already knew what Peter was coming in the house for. Before Peter even opened his mouth, Jesus intervened. And if, even if there wasn't any money in that house, Jesus could have made some appear right there on the spot. But he's trying to get a point across to Peter. You can trust me. You don't have to doubt me. You can fully trust me. But then I think about us. Why do we doubt God? We, we, we so, well, I can speak for myself. I struggle with doubt time and time again. I have seen God work in mighty ways. I know that he is Jehovah Jireh. I know that he is the provider. And not only does he provide what we need, he provides more than we need, just like he did for Peter in this instance. But yet I still struggle with doubt. Why do we do that? Why do we continue to struggle with doubt even though we know God has always come through in the past and we know that he's going to come through but yet we worry, we have, we have anxiety and we doubt. We're so much like Peter, at least I am. And we need constant reminders that he is Jehovah Jireh and that he will come through. That's why Peter was wanting to build shelters as a memorial because he needed that reminder that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he is the Son of the living God. And I want to remind you today, no matter what you are going through, no matter what storm you are uh, battling, no matter what life challenge 
you are facing. God is with you, and He will provide every need that you have. He will come through. It, it, it may it may feel like hell, and it may feel like that you are just being overwhelmed. And maybe you are overwhelmed, but hold on. Hold on and be reminded that He is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. He will come through. And not only will He provide what you need, He will provide you more than what you need. Because He's going to show you grace and mercy and compassion, just like He did for Peter and the rest of these disciples. Just like He did for all of those people who doubted. It's okay to doubt. But don't let that doubt steal your faith. Overcome that doubt. Get in the Word and let the Holy Spirit build that faith within you and hold to the hand of God through this storm and you will see Him come through. I promise you. He promised you. God bless you. Keep grinding. Thanks for listening to The Grounded Podcast. If we could pray for you or encourage you in any way, please email us at thegroundedpodcast at gmail.com or you can text us at 865-418-2824. If you're watching on YouTube, please click like and subscribe and you'll be notified about new episodes. If you're listening on an app, leave us a five-star review, but most importantly, share The Grounded Podcast with a friend. God bless you and remember, keep grinding.